you've transcended a liminal threshold into history fuzz, a realm of contemplative inquiry in which leading researchers discuss the motivations, tools and skills of the Skywatcher surveyors, architects and builders who delineated monumental landscapes with awe-inspiring structures enshrining their diverse cosmic chronicles in stone. I'm your host, Ashley Cowie. You can unlock videos, maps, articles, and enjoy early ad-free new episodes by becoming a member on HistoryFuzz.com, where you can also apply to join our team exploring and filming archaeology documentaries in the Andean highlands of Colombia. Dr. Robert Weiner is an archaeologist in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Specializing in religion, cognition and mind, Robert is renowned for his interpretations of ancient Chacoan roads in the U.S. Southwest, which he studies in collaboration with the Navajo Nation. In episode 2, Professor Stephen Lexon outlined this seemingly endless matrix of crisscrossing roads and ceremonial alignments. And herein, Robert Weiner takes us deeper into this monumental landscape, discussing indigenous mythology, cosmology, spirituality, and oral traditions. By systematically presenting and contextualizing a string of mythogeodetic concepts, Robert recounts stories from tiny oral history, including insights into gambling, violence, and social control within Chacoan society. We also compare ancestral Puebloan ceremonial road dynamics with those of contemporary South American Andean cultures discussing the great efforts that were made to achieve straightness within chaotic and unpredictable environments. We further examine the Chaco Meridian, which was outlined by Professor Stephen Lexon in Episode 2, revealing that Aztec ruins, the last bastion of the Anasazi in Chaco Canyon, was built precisely south of Mount Wilson. With this topographic sentinel visible on the north horizon, marking the celestial pole on the land, we discuss how a north-to-south meridian could indeed have been extended south by a group of elites migrating from Aztec ruins to Pacimé in northern Mexico. This discussion exists beneath and beyond the constraints of modern philosophy and cosmology as Dr. Robert Weiner presents the engineered landscapes of New Mexico through holistic and animistic perspectives. After my first interview with Professor Giulio Magli from the Polytechnic in Milan, who's a leading figure in archaeoastronomy, he suggested I contact Professor Steve Lexon, and I've interviewed Steve, and on three occasions through that interview, he said, you'd have to ask Rob Weiner about that, and three times. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, I love it, I love it. How do you know Steve? I first met Steve probably around eight years ago when I was trying to decide where to where to go for my um, PhD training. Mm -hmm. And I ended up going with, with Colorado and Steve's not my main advisor, but he was on my committee and a close mentor throughout that time. And we continue, I guess we've now maybe passed, he's still a mentor, but now that I have my degree, I suppose we've passed into the, the stage of being colleagues as well as friends and uh, mm. the teacher student relationship as well. To open our discussion about Chacoan or Chaco archaeology, I'd like you to discuss your work in New Mexico, Arizona, and Turkey. Absolutely. So my I grew up in New Mexico. So the archaeological sites of Chaco and the greater Four Corners have always been close to me. Yeah. But having grown up there, at first I wanted to, you know, 
begin my archaeological career away from home. So I did some work in Turkey initially at a at a pilgrimage site, a Hellenistic pilgrimage site up in the mountains of southeast Turkey near Bodrum called Labranda, which was amazing and inspiring. But eventually I was drawn back home to the southwest and um, received some training there at University of Utah and elsewhere. And then when it was time to initiate a field project for my doctoral work, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I couldn't resist looking further into the Chacoan Roads. Using layman's terms, could you describe what you believe to be the primary functionality of the Chaco Great House? Great houses have been a subject of debate for many, many years. They're huge buildings, multiple stories tall, very, very thick walls. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of evidence suggesting not a lot of people, not a lot of, let's say, human beings lived inside of them. There aren't many cooking hearths. The doors are small and hard to pass through. Hmm. So returning to the, uh, that training I had in the Mediterranean world, in the world of classical archaeology, I looked at these structures and I said, you know, if we were in Turkey, if we were in Greece, these things would be called temples. But here in the Southwest, they get these sort of, oh, maybe they're big pueblos, maybe they're just something vague, like ritual structures. So I decided to follow up on that line of reasoning to ask, what is a temple in the classical world? It's a word we throw around a lot, but really, what are temples? And I found that cross-culturally, not only in, in what we would call the old world as well as the new world, frequently a temple is a house for a god. The word, the the native word for temple in many of these languages is god house, and that is from Nawa, you know, among the Aztecs to the Sumerians. Yeah. So a temple is a house for a god, which expands, you know, forces us in the present, especially archaeologists, to expand our minds to think about how do people across time and space think about deities. We think about them using the sort of concepts that human use to think about other people. And in that sense, gods need to be fed. Maybe they don't need to be fed, but the, the way humans know to interact with an immaterial being like that, conceptualized somewhat as a person, is to feed it, is to house it, is to clothe it. And thus, so many temple structures are where deities physically reside, often in the form of a cult statue or some other um, material, I don't want to say representation, but embodiment. Mm. So I began to think through Ch the archaeology of Chaco and great houses with these concepts derived from looking far afield from, you know, the Maya world to the classical Greeks, um, really all over the world. Not that it's the same everywhere, but there are broad contours to this pattern. If you look at a contemporary temple in Colombia, 12th century, say, the temple is a shrine in which one can commune with divinity through the Axis Mundi. Are you suggesting in Chacoa culture that the god was perceived as actually residing temporally here and that one physically interacted with divinity? I think either... Of the two possibilities you just brought up are possible. But yes, I think we see it cross-culturally that the god is physically in the temple, either as, a, like in Egypt, it was a little statue in early, um, so this would be like geometric period Greece. It was a piece of wood, a really old looking piece of wood. Mm -hmm. And in Chaco, there are a lot of things that could have, these, these sort of animate potent, powerful deities could have been. They could have been some kind of objects now long gone, pieces of wood, as I've argued, could have been the bodies of, of revered deceased ancestors, you know, stored, who, who were interred in room 33. So I think the materiality is very important. May have been something immaterial, but as archaeologists, material evidence is what we have to work with, of course, but also humans frequently, we anchor our beliefs, our reasoning about the world, our engagement with what is often considered the conceptual world in physical things, mm. symbols, objects. And um, many cultures look at those not as something inert, but as, as we would say, oh, just inert matter, but as something very alive and vibrant. Do you think that you're restricted by your modern inclination to create dualities. What I mean by that is 
I live in the high Andes of Colombia and I work with indigenous cultures here. I take part in their ceremonies, the non-ayahuasca ones. We can talk about that later. They're everyday living, they're farming, they're cloning, they're seeding, they're fertilizing animal and each other was all one cosmology. Do you find yourself against personal hurdles on your inclinations towards duality? That's a really perceptive question. And yeah, I think about this a lot. Mm. The way I've come to understand it through engaging with various indigenous cultures and, and friends and colleagues, people in the Southwest from both Diné cultures and, and Pueblos, is that, yes, there is those dualisms are much more broken down. And yet there are places, objects, times that are more potent that are more powerful doesn't mean that this what we in Western culture would call the sacred doesn't pervade everything, but there are still certain structures, buildings, places, spaces that are more potent than others, mm -hmm. where things maybe come activated, like a space, the plaza space of a Pueblo, for example, that most of the year, you know, people are walking around and parking their cars in it. At a certain time, you know, when a ceremony is happening, that becomes activated. It's now sacred space. Mm. Or a hogan in, in Navajo culture, it becomes activated as a sacred space for the time when the ceremony is taking place. And then it returns to its more quotidian purpose. So I think I, I agree with what you're saying. And I also want to add that there, there are times and places of greater power. So now, having established that, this brings me to your research on, I don't like to call them roads. I think roads is a modern standard projected back. I think it's a mundane, non-living object, the road, where I think your study is more on ways. And on that note, I'm going to ask you to, to outline the parameters of your research into mapping and interpreting. So all across the Chaco landscape of the four corners in the U.S. Southwest, this is about 100,000 square kilometers, about the size of the, the, the state of Ohio in the U.S. for <laughs> listeners from, from the states. It was a rough idea. And there are these very, very straight, very wide, nine meter wide, carved out linear channels shooting across the landscape. So as you were saying, Ashley, these have become known as roads in popular discourse within Chaco and archaeology and, and more broadly within global archaeology. Everybody knows about the Chaco and roads. Of course, when we call them roads, this conjures all these modernist notions of transportation and economics and trade and efficiency and capitalist logics and so forth. But these features at Chaco seem to be something different. They do not lend themselves to an uh, interpretation of efficiency. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The massive amount of labor went in to make these things so wide when the Chacoans had no wheeled vehicles. They had no pack animals. Sometimes you have parallel, parallel routes of roads, so two nine-meter-wide roads side by side, totally unnecessary for any so-called functional purpose. And when we look at the destinations of the roads, they go to what, what I term in, in what I've come to call in my research, places of power. So this is returning to what we were just talking about, places in the landscape that are considered infused with this generative potency, or using Western terminology, we might say sacredness. So this is often places like springs, mountain peaks, shrines with views towards important places in the landscape. Sometimes a road will point towards uh, where the sun is going to come up on the winter solstice. So what these roads are doing is they're marking on landscape places. They're like a form of writing. They're marking what was a place of power in the Chacoan culture. And they're showing the Chaco people's more than desire, but deeply inspired drive mm. to connect themselves and their buildings with these animate aspects of the greater landscape through drawing literal connections on the ground in the form of these carved out roadways. That is a great introduction. Thank you. And a question rises, which is this. I wonder if you're looking at one effort 
to, to monumentalize a landscape that was conducted in a short period of time, or if you're looking upon a fragmentary shuffled up jigsaw with pieces from different dynasties? Well, that's a really tricky question. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mainly because it's so hard to date the roads. You know, they were created by digging a linear channel and piling the earth on the sides. And at certain points, people did scatter broken pottery along the roads, probably as a form of offering. Maybe we'll get to that later. So we can date when people scattered pottery on the roads, but saying when they're built is really tricky. That said, in my doctoral work, I did find evidence that some of the roads appear to be back as early as what's called the Basket Maker Three period in the Southwest. That's about 500 to 700. There's at least one road that looks um, quite convincingly from the Basket Maker Three period. Mm -hmm. And that's about, you know, at least a couple centuries before any of the great houses are built in Chaco. So I've begun to wonder if this, whatever... Chaco was, I think of it as a religious movement, but it has politics wrapped up and dynasties, as you've mentioned. If one of the earliest manifestations of that was not the great houses, but rather the creation of these roads, which are much easier to create than, you know, quarrying stone and shaping it and stacking it to make multi-story buildings. That's something quite complex, which the Chacoans figured out and they had expert masons that could do it. But digging a road is much simpler. So I wonder if in these earlier, earlier periods, actually the roads were the catalytic factors that led to these later developments within Chaco and society, some of the roads. Mm. Okay, so you're suggesting that the roads were laid out by an older society and that was developed then by building architecture at significant points within these roads, essentially that the roads and the great houses didn't possibly happen together. In some locales of the Chaco world, I think what you just described is what happens. In other cases, it's pretty clear that the road and the great house comes in at the same time. So I think there's a diversity of things happening throughout multiple centuries across 100,000 square kilometers. But there are certain instances where a place has long been an important spot on the landscape. Maybe you first just have a little pile of rocks marking it as something important. Then later on, the people build a road. Then they build a great kiva. Maybe then eventually they build a Chaco and great house. And archaeologists come to it and they say, oh, look, there's a great house here. And we could be missing those, you know, hundreds or even, well, yeah, let's say hundreds of years of history before the great house got constructed on top of what was a place of power, a significant place in the landscape. In Moisca, Colombia, I'm going to keep referring to because I know it so well, we have a massive benefit that that you unfortunately don't have. And that is when the Spanish arrived here, um, Pedro Simon interviewed about 50 Moisca shaman. And in those records are the reports on the Holy Roads. So we have a report from 1608 that talks about ceremonial Holy Roads being laid out as if the shamans had rolled balls of ribbon over the landscapes from horizon to horizon. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And so many sacred roads, they don't go anywhere. They stop in the middle of a desert or stop in the middle of a jungle. But do you see any evidence of these roads or these tracks being related to time, time more than space? There are so many roads that we still, you know, there are hundreds of roads in the Chaco world that we haven't looked at yet. And even of those we have looked at, there are a bunch that I cannot tell where they're going. They, as you say, they end sort of mysteriously. You have maybe 90% of a a region that you're exploring has temple to temple or building to building, or this is a very obviously a solstice rise, but you're saying you find roads without end, you roads with no terminus. Absolutely. I'll never forget. There's one site in Arizona on the Navajo Nation that I was so excited to go work there and map the roads there. It's a beautiful great house and big monster roads. And I get out there, you know, so some colleagues were looking around and 
I had, you know, all my gear ready to document what the roads are aligned to. Cause up to this point, all the sites I had documented, the roads made really clear alignments towards a mountain on the horizon or to a spring, et cetera, et cetera. And I get to the site, it's called, um, it's called Navajo Springs and the roads are just vanishing off under the horizon. I mean, there's nothing you can see on the horizon. The road goes off and it ends. Huh. So I think there are a lot of cases where the referent of the road is going to be very hard to figure out. I mean, so one, I know one tradition that exists in, in certain lineages of knowledge within the Navajo um, culture, for example, is that certain roads are related to the stars, to constellations. And so that's only, you're asking about temporality. There's going to be certain times of year when constellations are rising and maybe that road was only used at that time of the year. And it's going to be really unclear what it's pointing to at, at other times. So that um, my, my colleague and friend Taft Blackhorse from, from Navajo Nation, he has said pretty explicitly, yeah, a lot of these things are lining up to constellations and it's, you know, it's going to take some work to, based on his traditional, his cultural knowledge, his cultural knowledge, mm. um, it's going to take some work to, to follow up. C can I follow up with two quick points here that I just, things you brought up earlier that I wanted to mention, you know, this, the use of this word road, I've felt similarly to you where it's like, ah, I don't want to call it road. I don't want to call them roads. This conjures all these modernist notions. And yet, in doing this sort of cross-cultural work that I'm very interested in, you know, reading about roadways from all these other indigenous cultures in, in more recent times and in quite ancient ones, so many of the, so many roads are ceremonial and sacred as to use our modern terminology. So there was a, there's an archaeologist named Timothy Earle who did a review of roads in sort of what he calls chiefdom societies across time and space. And he finds they're almost never used for economics and commerce prior to the onset of, of market economies. There's just not the economies of scale that it makes sense to put all this effort into building a road unless you have a certain type of economy. So actually, I now am happy calling them roads because studying the ancient world more closely most ancient roads are something more like these ceremonial avenues rather than economic corridors. Of course, that comes in with the Romans and it and there's the Inca, Kapak Nyan. Mm. These things do exist, but I was just sort of very surprised and, and quite pleased to find just how common ceremonial roads are. Like there's a great one at Stonehenge, for example. We could go on and on and on. The other thing I wanted to, well, okay, let's leave it at that. No, no, let's not leave it at that. A road is associated with something the feet walks on, but a way has much deeper and more esoteric connotations. And I still would have to go with way in front of road because a road to me is something that is used to deliver an object from A to B. So... I get it what you're saying about road, but the use of the word road maybe builds hurdles to deeper questioning what might way mean. Because see these ceremonies we go to, it's all about it, them encouraging you to clear your own way. And the way to do that is through community synchronization of work and worship. That's the way, and I think that these roads come from esoteric concepts rather than temporal efforts. I'm going to have to shut up and let you come back at me. I think we are certainly gesturing towards the same thing. Mm, mm. Yeah, I think we're we're seeing eye to eye on this, and and I hear you. I like the word. I like the word way as well. So the English translation of a ceremonial, a particular. Any given ceremony in Navajo culture, it gets translated into English as, for example, the beauty way. Oh, wow. The enemy way. Really? The water way. And that's not exactly, uh, it's not exactly how it is in Navajo language, but that's how it gets translated. And, and it, but it has the whole connotation, right? The, wa the, wa the water way, the beauty way, the blessing way. And yeah, I think that's a lovely way to talk about, <laughs> it's a lovely way <laughs> to talk about 
these Chaco and corridors alignments, because it is encompassing so much, like you're saying, time, space, the wide world of beings other than humans. Do you see any examples of the trade roads and ceremonial roads following the same orientations? I want to first go back to, to one of your earlier points about, about mythology and written, written records, etc., to say that we do in the Southwest, you know, we have living descendants of the Chacoans who, who have, you know, the, the Navajo people, the Pueblo people, Pueblo people, Navajo people. Roads are an ongoing part of their cultures, ongoing part of their mythologies, ongoing part of their ceremonialism. So a lot of those traditions do live on. They may not be in written form, but there are incredibly detailed and illuminating, let's say, oral traditions, some of which have been documented by anthropologists, many of which are held as more restricted knowledge within the communities. People are often reticent to talk about these things, given the very ugly history of, of colonialism and anthropologists extracting sacred knowledge um, in, in, in inappropriate ways from the communities. But there's certainly these traditions. So, for example, both Pueblo and Navajo cultures have the tradition when they are seeking to connect with a, a deity or a spiritual being of sprinkling cornmeal, a line of cornmeal, which is specifically called a road, mm, mm. opening the road for that line of communication to open up. So while <clears throat> in more historic times or more recent times, uh, Pueblo and Navajo people are not building nine meter wide massive roads across the landscape, these traditions do live on as much more ephemeral things. So it's like the concepts persisted in the culture, but the materiality of it changed. So rather than building a massive road, you now have a cornmeal road, or there are much smaller pilgrimage trails that are doing the same thing. They're going to places of power on the landscape. They're used at certain times of year by certain people who have to undertake particular you know, offerings, dances, songs, etc., along those as part of maintaining the balance and the harmony of this greater world. Mm -hmm. So it's, I hear you that it is different than having a Spanish written account from the 1500s of like asking an indigenous person, what's this road about? But that, that continuity is still there. And it, it is, I think, indispensable for archaeologists or any of us trying to trying to get a clearer understanding of these these ways. Ha. Huh. You mentioned the word harmonization. Here in Colombia, the Moiskas made all of the efforts possible to harmonize perceived chaotic energies. Gold was associated with the sun and male principles. Silver was associated with the moon and female principles. They would make huge deposits of gold and silver at different times of the year to control what are perceived as fluctuating energies and taking you right to the threshold of new age bullshit. <laughs> Do you see efforts to control and harmonize these perceived telluric energies? Succinctly, yes. Do you see efforts to control and harmonize these perceived telluric energies? Succinctly, yes. And if we turn to, so I'll, I'll talk about oral traditions of, of Pueblo and Navajo people that are published. Mm. Almost all of them, when talking about Chaco, convey the notion that Chaco was a place where certain members of society had those kinds of powers you're talking about powers over the wind, over the rain, over the, the celestial bodies, the sun and the moon and the stars. And people could control them, and that power was abused. And eventually the society had to be changed because that was something improper. Now, again, you mentioned New Age bullshit, so there's sort of one read on that from a modernist perspective, which is like, oh yeah, there's just nonce, blah, blah, blah. But I think it's really important that we take this seriously where we think about the interconnectedness of 
the natural world and the human world. Look at the world we're in today, where the where there are massive changes happening in the climate, catastrophic weather events. And it's very widely accepted that humans are implicated in that happening. So the fact that the natural world, what we call the natural world, the weather, the winds, the rains, the elements, have profound effects on history. And the fact that what humans do is part of that, it's not like we're something separate from the earth. We are part of this earth and the actions we take influence the earth, the actions the earth takes influence us. And in these descriptions of what Chaco is like, I think we're really seeing that, like many indigenous people, they're we're more keyed in to those often very subtle interdependencies and interconnections. And again, I think if as archaeologists, if if as archaeologists or anthropologists or historians, we're going to approach some understanding of the past, we have to take the worldviews of the people who lived at that time seriously. And the fact that almost all the oral traditions from descendants about Chaco are about people getting, you know, you're talking about these sort of powers inherent latent in the earth, tapping into those and meddling with them, then I think that has to be a part of how we talk about the history, even if it challenges some of our contemporary ontological suppositions yeah i'm going to give you an example of the community use perhaps of such an energy if you like when we went to a ceremony and we filmed a documentary in a traditional moiska clearing ceremony and it was happening the day before they plant their seeds which is the tw the 22nd of february is my birthday it's when the indigenous cultures plant their seeds so for the weeks leading up to it they clear the fields clear the irrigation ditches clear the ways and everything's ready for this fertilization process. So we're in the temple with about 10 indigenous wearing their white ceremonial garb and about four of us filming. And it was in a classic buho. Uh, a buho is a grass and bamboo built hut, a big thing. This is their chief temple of the sun beside Laguna Guatavita, which is a circular lake associated with their moon goddess. I was interviewing the Moisca leader. All of the, the temples have a medicine lady who administers she administers rapi, which is tobacco rustica. It's an indigenous tobacco that's perhaps 10 or 15 times stronger than what people smoke in cigarettes. So when you, you get it blown up your nose through a bird bone whistle. So I was sitting there, Robert, like a right dick, being resistant to all this. The maracas came out and I was like, oh my God, here comes the maracas. <laughs> And then and yeah, and then out and then out came the flowers and there was petals going around, and I was lodged in this material tourist's perspective of a ritual. And I, I thought, let me just give this the full on. I believe in all this. I believe in the energies, the clearance of them, their interaction with me. And and I'll tell you, when I took down my barriers, I really felt lighter, physically lighter, and as if you're in the air, and then they use these really gritty rubbings. They rub earth on drums to create earth sounds. And before you know it, both auditorily and visually, you are being pulled down into the earth. So now go back 800 years, and this was part of your everyday, the sounds, the rituals, the at different times of the year. So, yes, there are efforts there in your region to balance those energies that are perceived to exist in the landscape. And that takes me to something here, Robert, which is the primary reason I've got you here. Firstly, would you agree that in the Chaco Canyon, because you can't see the South Celestial Pole, but you can see the North Celestial Pole, there was perhaps quite a significance placed in the North. Would you please define that? The Chaco Meridian, the North Alignment, which is written about by Steve Lexon in 1999, and then I'm going to deep dive because I've got questions about the Meridian, but could you please define that and the importance placed in North? There's a lot to say about North. Say it. Yeah, in, <laughs> in, in Chaco, many of, there are a lot of cardinal alignments in the buildings. There are alignments between, like the whole central complex is laid out in a big cardinal cross. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. in fact. So this idea of the cardinal directions is was clearly ordering their architecture. And yes, as you said, looking north on the horizon, um, Polaris, it was off of due north by a few degrees in the Chaco and I think five degrees, something like that in, in the Chaco era. But still, these people were observing the heavens closely. There's no question about that. And they would have seen that the stars were dancing, swirling, you know, around this heart of the sky, as it's been called I've, in, in some Pueblo traditions, the yeah. heart of the sky in, in the north. In, in many Pueblo traditions, it's repeatedly stated. They say, you know, we, they always say we came from the north. We emerged out of the earth in the north. Um, some more scientifically minded archaeologists would could draw uh, um, an association between that and these hypotheses that you know the first Native American people came across the Bering Strait um, into what is now the United States from you know far north in in uh, th that Bering territory. So yes, north. It plays in, it factors in in all these ways. There's a there's a very well-known road or way, shall we call it, in the Chaco world. It starts in Chaco Canyon itself and it runs about 50 kilometers due north to the edge of a very dramatic Badlands multicolored canyon. It just, uh, you're going across very empty, undifferentiated sagebrush terrain and then the North Road comes to the edge of this canyon called Kutz Canyon and plunges straight off the edge down to the depths of the earth in this really striking um, Badlands shale topography. So following that North Road, there's a little disagreement. Did it drop into the canyon and then go to the site called, called Salman and then up to Aztec? Did it go across the canyon? Point is that the, the site what what we might what Steve would call the capital of the Chaco culture, starting in in about the 1100s, seem it, it, it's pretty clear it moves to this place called Aztec in Aztec, New Mexico, which is due north of Chaco Canyon, extending that North Road line. Mm. So this is what Steve proposed as this idea of the Chaco Meridian that there was a leadership, a powerful political religious leadership at Chaco, and that in the 1100s, they moved their capital due north. I sometimes talk about Aztec as the Constantinople to, to Chaco as, as Rome. Mm. And Steve's argument about the North Road is that it was a way of the Chacoans writing history on the landscape, saying we moved our capital along this meridian up to Aztec, and here's a road marking that historical event. I think there's a lot of merit in that. I think there's other dimensions too, such as... Um, that Kutz Canyon where the road plunges into the depths of the earth is also a very powerful place that was probably long recognized as a religiously significant place in, in the Chaco world. Yeah. I will just finish this discussion of the Meridian by saying that Steve then noticed that the next, what he would say, largest, most interesting site in the Southwest um, in the 1300, sort of, uh, yeah, 1300s, pops up in a place called Paquimé or Casas Grandes, down in um, Chihuahua, which is on that same line, but far south of Chaco now. And there's architectural connections tying the three sites together. Um, this idea is very controversial within Southwestern archaeology, but I really, um, I really like the idea. I mean, I could raise points that I think need you know, stronger argument. But at the end of the day, I like that Steve is talking about the history of the Southwest in these historical ways that give people agency, that bring in politics, that bring in sort of symbolism and systems of um, meaning beyond just, oh, people were, uh, you know, trying to survive and grow corn and adapting to their environments. Yeah, that's all true. But these were human beings, too. And they could build incredibly complex structures. They did all of these amazing things, and they could have, you know, built their capitals along a, a symbolically meaningful meridian um, as well. Mm, mm. So that is the basic intro to the <laughs> Chaco Meridian idea.
I want to really get into this with you because I have two or three suggestions which I asked Stephen, this is where he deferred to you, was this. <clears throat> Prior to the Aztec site being located, mm -hmm. th there is a difference in the variance from north to south from the Aztec site to the one they were in previous. But the Aztec site represents the first meridian because... It is within a 20 meter variance from the tip of Mount Wilson in the north, which would suggest, like many other indigenous landscapes, the highest rise in the landscape represented the southward meridian. Well, Steve has proposed that the meridian goes back as far as Basket Maker 3 period, which I was bringing up earlier to the 500s, when Chaco Canyon is a big deal. Long before the Great Houses, there are massive villages there with astronomical associations, as I've mm -hmm. suggested in a publication. And he says then they move up to um, Ridges Basin, which is near Durango, Aztec, and then back down to Chaco and then back up to Aztec and then down to Paquimé. So what it might appear to be is that prior to Aztec, the people were establishing north to south sites with Mount Wilson, but it was when they got to Aztec that they did it within a 20 meter variance, which to me is beyond coincidence, I think. Yeah, that's very interesting about the mountain due north of Aztec that's very high. And these people knew their landscape. The generator of all water. All water comes from the melt at the top of Mount Wilson into the valleys. Yeah. Yeah. So I... I I find it very likely that, that people would have known that and that would have been an important place. And the fact it's due north of Aztec is uh, would have been recognized and would have been important. Mm. They don't just plop sites in willy-nilly locations. You know, I don't know if the Chaco Meridian goes to Pakime. I think there are really interesting connections between Pakime and Chaco and Aztec. Those who... Um, are critical of Steve's argument, I've yet to hear a really convincing explanation for why these architectural conventions from Chaco and Aztec also appear at Pakime. Now, yeah, I don't think it's helpful to think about the meridians or even Chaco and alignments in, in the logics or the in the, yeah, in the logics of contemporary astronomy. These people were not using abstract numbers i i don't think you know things were done through observation and a f it, you know a few degrees here and there i don't think it was about extreme precision it was about um visual alignments it was about uh, geomet importance of geometric templates it was about the animate power of the sun and the moon it was about stories and mythologies and associations along particular orientations. So I think, um, again, we cannot even fathom what it was to be a Chaco person, much less a Chaco person trying to maintain a north meridian over undulating terrain for hundreds of kilometers. So mm. I think... Of course, there has to be a, le a margin beyond which something is no longer aligned, right? If it's too far off or if it wiggles too much, then we have to be good. You know, we have to be critical thinkers at some level. But I think often it's over applied where people want to test things and talk about degrees and minutes and seconds. And and that was not in the Chacoan reality. So I think it's much more of a I mean, again, if we look cross culturally, Directions really matter. Sites are built on, you know, like say the Chinese tradition of feng shui, where cities were laid out according to different mountains, different orientations and directionalities that all had a meaning and a significance. I, I see the Chacoan um, situation being no different. If we were to look at the way ancient Egyptian cultures associated with the northern stars, the pyramid has the shaft because they believe the souls return to the fixed northern stars after death. Um, somebody recently described the north sky as the vault of the ancestors. You can understand how much importance was given in that northern alignment and how one would associate the stretching of a dynasty or the stretching of a culture with their ancestors' vault, if you like, this fixed, non-chaotic aspect in an otherwise wild and unpredictable world. Got to ask you a question, though. Let me 
look at Steve's projected meridian. The skeptical argument is that let's say a dynasty and its consorts and greater families had gone and performed such a mission from left Aztec and moved south. They would have required somewhere between one and two tons of food a day to survive, and they would have been getting attacked on the way. Isn't there any validation on the idea that perhaps the people began in the south and and that that meridian was drawn north? How could you know that wasn't a culture that moved north to the Chaco Canyon with their architecture rather than Chacoans moving south? So... I, one thing I want to say or, or push back on a little bit is I don't know that they, they would have been attacked moving south. So, okay. for example, there's some interesting references in, in Tim Pocketat's new book. Mm. Tim has been a great mentor and, and just such a caring person and helpful, helpful person in, in my life. So he's very generous. Tim will be on the show, so you can ask him about this. Um, sort of sh- shamans or religious specialists from indigenous si- societies in North America were often granted safe passage through um, the territories of other groups. So I-, I don't think we should take it as a initial assumption that they would have necessarily been attacked if these were seen as people even from another culture on a, a sort of cosmologically sanctified mission to extend this line. Mm. Um so thought experiment. Now, could it have started in the South? Well, it could have, but Steve's argument is a chronological one where Pakime is occupied in the 1300s. Chaco is occupied well, well, well before that. So I think it's a harder sell to say that the Chaco Meridian started in in northern Mexico or maybe somewhere further south and was just kept going north, 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 north. Mm. Um, There are clear Mesoamerican connections at Chaco. People were importing macaws, chocolate, cacao, uh, copper bells. Perhaps some of these astronomical traditions were inspired by Mesoamerican um, societies. Perhaps the very idea of nobles and commoners and hierarchy that we see so clearly at Chaco was inspired by Mesoamerican precedents. So they were certainly, these cultures were all in dialogue with one another. I, I think it's a harder to build a convincing argument that the specific, what is it? I think it's on 108, 108 degrees meridian would have originated in Mesoamerica and been extended up, up to Chaco. That's my take. Um, Magley's work always presents dynastic heritage with the creation of prime meridians. For example, in Cambodia, one ruler would extend the meridian, the state meridian of his father or his grandfather with a new temple, or perhaps he'd move it a significant distance to the east or west, refounding a new um, center, if you like. When you look at the architectural formats of the great houses and of the pyramids of Mesoamerica, do you see an architectural progression from the cardinality in Chaco to the monumentality and verticality that is then expressed in Mesoamerica? Is there a progression architecturally? Nice question. <laughs> um mm. The I you know so I'm I'm very interested in this question of monumentality. Why do people decide to suddenly build enormous things way beyond what they need for daily daily needs? So this applies in Chaco, right? People are living in pit houses and small, uh, you know, small, very humble structures, and then seemingly, you know, then they start building these bigger things, and eventually they're four stories tall with hundreds of rooms and you know, why do people do that? Certainly one hypothesis is that they got the idea from elsewhere. Yeah. And Mesoamerica had lots of very big structures. They weren't necessarily buildings, though. Like Chaco and grade houses had discrete rooms, which is different than, say, a pyramid, which is more of a, a mound. I don't know that much about pyramid architecture in Mesoamerica. So it's possible that the concept of building really tall things that tower into the sky and are aligned in meaningful ways 
came to Chaco from Mesoamerica. It's also possible that the that you know this is something that has happened independently in a bunch of parts of the world. Humans have a I would argue humans have a predilection for the monumental. Mm. In other words, the Mesoamericans you know, did they take the idea? Do we just trace back who took the idea from who took the idea from who back ad infinitum? Or do we allow that given certain sets of social conditions, environmental conditions, religious conditions, people will start building massive structures? So I'm I'm sort of on the fence about the extent to which Chacoan monumentality was a ripple effect from Mesoamerica. I think it's definitely possible. They certainly knew about each other. Also, I think, you know, we um, lots of people have developed monumental structures across across the world, and it seems to be a human thing to do. Does that does that help? It really, really does. But uh, you mentioned something there. You mentioned the macaw. Have you ever considered the amount of power you could conduct over a group of people owning a bird that talks. I published on the idea, in fact. Mm. I think it's hugely important. I mean, I think a lot of what these Chacoan leaders were doing was showing that they were maybe gods themselves, or they were certainly connected to this more powerful realm. And how did they, you know, what was the evidence they had of that? Well, they had birds that could speak. They had this magical beverage from distant mythical lands that gave people this buzzing mental state. They had these new bells made out of this mysterious substance we call copper that was not known in the ancient Southwest. Um, you know, they, they had shells, shell jewelry, shell trumpets, making these wondrous bellowing sounds. Were they using conch shell trumpets? Yeah. Yeah, really. And in Chaco, some of the conch shell trumpets had uh, turquoise mouthpieces, which I love because, you know, a lot of this, everything in this, I want to say everything, so much of, of religion, ceremonialism, whatever word you want to use for it in the Southwest has to do with moisture and rain because it's what we need. <laughs> it's dry. The rainfall is very unpredictable. Mm, mm. And so a lot of this material culture, I think, is evoking sort of watery, you know, this, the importance of turquoise. Oh, there it is. <laughs> turquoise, right? Is the Chacoans loved turquoise. Well, it's like, it's this blue color, like the sky where the water comes from, like the bodies of water themselves. It's like this workable medium of, of water made permanent, water made material. There's all the shell, there's the shell trumpets. And then this stuff coming from the tropics, I think is all sort of evoking this colorful, watery, fertile realm mm. that Chaco was not. And yet its leaders, you know, maybe had this prop proposition that, you know, our our religion, our tradition, you know, we are connected to this stuff. We will bring you to this place. We will make this stuff happen. And they had pretty clear evidence that they could. And a lot of people participated. It brought meaning to people. It brought at least harmonious enough social conditions to people that, you know, this Chaco system, religion, poli polity, whatever we want to call it, persisted for three centuries. How on earth do you distinguish between irrigation channels and wells against ceremonial ways and sacred sites? How do you start to do that? Because there must be irrigation system, right? Canals in Chaco Canyon is a long debate. Mm, mm. Early on, uh, many things were, that were identified as canals turned out to be roads, including, for example, a canal that ran uphill, right? Doesn't, doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, more recently, some scholars have argued that they have found evidence of canals in Chaco. I mean, I think the main difference in, in, in differentiating canals versus Chaco and roads or ways would be the width, because Chaco and roads are nine meters wide. And if you have enough water to be filling up a nine meter wide canal in the Southwest, you've got a problem. Yeah. That's a lot of water and it's gonna be destructive. 
And I've actually been caught in a flood in Chaco Canyon myself, and it's pretty scary, pretty powerful and intense. So I would not want to be in Chaco Canyon when when there was enough water to fill up a nine meter wide canal. So if there are, you know, maybe there were irrigation canals in the canyon. I don't find the evidence particularly clear or convincing at this point, but water would have collected in the roads. I don't think it would have been flowing as this like huge mass of thing, but I think it's important that the, you know, roads in so many parts, like if we think about Roman roads, they were um, built in a convex fashion. So water, and they were camber, right? So water would flow off the sides. The Chacoan roads, on the other hand, were concave. They were depressed channels. So anytime it rained, they and, and the soils in that area are full of clay and water hangs around for a long time. So they would have filled with water huh. after rainstorms. And I think that is actually, so some have discussed this as a problem for the roads or, oh, maybe the roads are actually built to channel water away from buildings. There might be some of that. But again, if we think about water and the importance of that in surviving in the Southwest, Mm -hmm. then we can come to a new understanding, which is that if these are sacred roads where practices are taking place to bring the cosmos into balance, into harmony, to perpetuate the longevity of society and then they fill up with this precious substance hey that's a pretty good thing shows that the rituals were effective but it also takes us right back to what you said at the start perhaps the rain or the water serves to switch on the roads to generate the latent energy that isn't there in the dry season but when those roads are shining at night under the moon the the gods are with us absolutely absolutely Robert, um, this question is going to sound abstract, but it does have connotations and you'll probably get them quick. We've talked about time and space, but I'd like to talk around the, another element or another dimension, which is sound. Were there frogs in the Chaco Canyon or are there frogs? Yes, there are frogs in Chaco and they come, they emerge from beneath the earth after the rain, and they start singing their wondrous songs. Here's why. Here in the valley, when it's in the dry season, you can hear one or two frogs in the wells and around the valley. And then not six minutes before the rain, but three weeks before the rain, you hear more activity. The valley starts to get louder. And then when the rain arrives, the valley is gone completely filled with frogs. Now, this is going to blow you. Do you know what is known to stop the noise of frogs in an instant? Guess what it is? I'm talking to Timothy about this. Big birds. Macaws, for example, Robert. Mm. See where I'm going with this? Controlling animals, controlling sounds, controlling environments. So I would imagine if I was a form of shaman trying to maintain and enhance my perceived control over nature having a bird and a pond of frogs i I could make myself appear like david blaine what do you think that's pretty interesting that's pretty interesting and i will tell you one thing which is that there are that one of the most famous artifacts from chaco is a carved effigy made out of jet, so black jet, with lots of turquoise, a beautiful little turquoise inlay and turquoise eye inlay, and it's a frog. Oh, really? Got to be one of the most most famous objects from Chaco. I'm happy to send you a, a photograph. And there's also, a f- you'll, you'll like this too, <laughs> based on what you just shared with me. There's a flute. What, there's, a, there's quite a few wooden flutes at Chaco, and one of them has an animal carved on it that the interpretation of which is ambiguous, but I, ha- I, I've suggested it's it's a frog. That's fantastic. There exist artifacts which are about eight or ten centimeters. They're wooden. They're hollowed out, and they've got ridges between the holes, and they look like flutes. However, there have been suggestions that these are worm grunting sticks. 
if you take these flutes and put them on the ground and rub another stick, it goes rickit, 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 like a frog. It makes a frog sound. But the worms think that's rain and, and it rises. I used to do it when I was fishing in Scotland, worm grunting. So go and have a look at your stick and imagine touching it on the ground and rubbing it with a stick. That might not be a flute, my friend. Amazing. Amazing. I can't wait to, to see how you're... How this whole show turns out, because you're working with some really, really fascinating material. If I have interviewed four of you or three of you about one area, the audience gets essentially a five or six hours deep dive from three leading authorities on any given subject. It's all about, over time, the arc is all of you guys will be telling the story of how we delineated our monumental sites, what happened and when it began at different points. So I'm doing it all around the world, Robert. So much of what you said is relatable to the Indian culture that I live around and within. And I um, highly suggest you research the holy roads of Moisca, Colombia, and have a look at how they connected their temples. I've got a 25,000 word paper. I could email you and bore you with it if you want, where I show you some mythological alignments because they have an ast astronomical um, landscape here with clearly astronomical roads, but the RQ astronomers have this whole separate category and they're the mythological roads, which beautifully connect site, natural sites of importance with temples. And you perhaps will find correlations between the delineation practices here and, and again in the Chaco Canyon. You got right to the threshold of the woo, didn't you? We were talking about energies and things, but you stuck within strict academic parameters and rigorous criteria and you got to explain to my audience what you truly think is going on with these alignments so i can't thank you enough robert i've really enjoyed the last hour and a half as have i yeah as i said what you're doing is so cool and yeah please send me please send me that paper i'd like to learn more about that area and i'll leave you with this which is so many of or many of my indigenous colleagues and friends you know, archaeologists get really uptight and, and you're, you're welcome to put this part in the interview if you want. Archaeologists get really uptight about connections between Chaco and Mesoamerica and were they connected. Yeah. So many of my indigenous friends say, Mesoamerica, man, you need to look further south. You need to get down into South America. We were all one people. We were all connected. We were all in communication. We have the same stories. And I think that's a real provocation to those of us as archaeologists, academic archaeologists, that we need to think bigger and we need to still be rigorous and not go off the rails. But mm, mm. for there, you know, for some reason, the same stories are in South America and Alaska. So if you consider in past times, in prehistoric times, it's quite possible that somebody could walk 40 kilometers a day and sustain it. The ancient world wasn't as distant as it is to us today. It was a much smaller interconnected world is that what you suggested there? oh absolutely i think we have unhelpful notions that the pre-modern world the indigenous world was sort of siloed and the people were in their little worlds and they didn't speak to their neighbors but it was it was cosmopolitan hmm. and it's a little dehumanizing i think to say that people weren't interested in what was beyond the horizon i would i would recommend to you a do I have it on my shelf here? I'd recommend to you a really fascinating book called Ulysses Sale by an anthropologist named Mary Helms. And she writes about um, basically people within small scale indigenous societies whose job it was to go to these distant mythicized lands and bring back powerful objects, knowledge, stories. And it's it's a it's a really fun read, but it also just shows that humans are interested in in far off distant places and learning from them, and those places have a certain aura around them. Even today, right? You oh, I I went to Cambodia and you know mm -hmm. learned. It's 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 part of our culture still, and it's been part of human culture for a long time. Thank you for coming on and melting away horizontal boundaries. It's been a lot of fun. Great stuff. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, hit subscribe, drop a five-star review or share it with a friend. And you can get in touch with me 
drewhistoryfuzz.com. <laughs>